All right, today we're going to talk about center manifold theory for maps. Um, this is in Wiggins section uh, 18.4. And just to get us started, I wanted to um, review what a map is. A map is something that uh, uh, we view it as take a point X and it maps to F of X. So a point um, X maps to F of X, like in this sketch over here, F is a function from Rn to Rn. So we're viewing Rn as our phase space. Another way that you could view it is as uh, um, we take a point Xn and then the map takes Xn and maps it to Xn plus one. So you could have, you know, starting with some initial condition X naught, then it goes to X1, goes to X2. Uh, and so on. Uh, the trajectory for an ODE is given by the flow map. When we talk about maps, we talk about the orbit. So if I were to speak of the orbit of the point X naught under an invertible map, Um, is it's going to look like a sequence. So we have X naught and then F of X naught. And then I'll use this terminology, uh, F kind of raised to some power and so on. Um, F K of X naught. And this is, what is F of K? F of K here is just shorthand for F compositions, so little circles, F compositions of the map. Sorry, not F, K compositions of the map. So this would be, you know, F of F of, and then it's embedded uh, many different times of X naught. So this is F, sorry, K applications of the map F, or K iterations of the map F. And K is an integer, it could be negative as well. So since we're assuming an invertible map, um, we could have things like this as well for the history of a, of a point. So think of a point X naught, and then it maps to f of x naught and so on. And it came from the inverse of x naught, et cetera. All right, so that's, th this follows uh, Wiggins terminology of, of what an orbit is, okay? And if we didn't have an invertible map, then we, we would only have, you know, from here to here, the positive iterates, but I will be assuming an, invertible map. I don't think it's terribly important for um, the discussion on center manifolds, but anyway, so that's that. Um, <clears throat> I guess just to give you a, an idea of a map. So for example, there's a map that I uh, created from a Hamiltonian system and I don't know if me and my co-author Dan Shears named it, but it was it was a 2D map um, related to orbital mechanics called the Keplerian map. And I just wanted to show it to you. It's a it's a map. Um, in fact, this isn't a map on RN, it's actually a map on the cylinder. So we're mapping from sigma is uh, S1 cross R. But the two parameters, there's this omega, which is a, an angle, and then k, which is just a real number. Uh, omega represents uh, an orbital parameter, and k represents an energy. So this is what the map looks like written in the usual, you know, x n plus 1 equals some function of n form. So this is an explicit um, map. We can write the map explicitly, uh, which is kind of interesting. And 
just like for ODEs, ODEs can have special structure. This has special structure. It's area preserving, and not only that, it's a category of map called a symplectic twist map, which shows up in Hamiltonian systems. So for those of you who are studying um, uh, either orbital mechanics, fluid mechanics, or vortex dynamics, you might uh, encounter symplectic twist maps anyway. And it's a fun little map. It, starting from some in initial condition, looking at the left-hand side, it, it reproduces sort of chaotic features that we see in the whole integration of ODEs of the restricted three-body problem. But it's very fast because it's, it's a map. You don't have to uh, use Runga Kutta to solve for ODEs. Anyway, uh, where was I? Here. Okay. So uh, maps show up um, in different contexts. Sometimes the most, some of the most important things are fixed points of maps. And so the fixed point of a map is the analog of an equilibrium point for an o ODE especially for the theory that we're, we're trying to build where we start with the simplest objects, um, zero dimensional invariant manifolds, and then look at other manifolds associated with them like stable, unstable, um, center. So if, um, if the map has a fixed point, let's call it X bar. That means that X bar equals F of X bar. So that point just maps back to itself. And um, if we want to understand the dynamics near this fixed point, we look at an associated linear map. where just like in the ODE case, we've got X bar, and now let's say we wanna look at some nearby point. We will look at what happens to the vector, the displacement vector Y, and the dynamics for Y will be given by Y maps to the Jacobian of F evaluated at the fixed point times Y. So this matrix, this is an N by N uh, constant matrix. So we would look at the, we'll look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this constant matrix. And this just gives to linear order. Of course, then you could start looking at other things, right? Second order terms, third order terms, and so on. Um, a purely nonlinear part. And when you study center manifolds, you do have to look at the nonlinear part. A, um, this is just a note that uh, a fixed point of a map is also called a period one point. of the map, which suggests that there could be period K points. So let me just say something about the periodic orbits of maps. As you might expect, a periodic orbit of a map will be something that comes back to itself after a certain number of iterates. So a, um, a periodic orbit 
of period K it's a sequence of points of length K so X not X1 all the way to X K minus 1 X K where uh, x naught equals x k. And it's also to be a periodic orbit, we have this such that uh, f of x i equals x i plus one for i zero to k minus one. And all of the x i are distinct. So for example, if we have, uh, here's x0, x0 maps to x1, which then maps to x2, which then maps to x3, and then this actually maps back to x0. This would be, this is a period for orbit. Okay, and uh, here's the here's a trick. You could reduce the study of the stability of a period four orbit um, to a period one orbit. You just you look at the, the like we wrote up above already k compositions of the map. And then for any of these points, we have that f of k of x i equals x i. So all points of uh, the period k orbit are actually fixed points of the map, let's call it f bar defined to be f K. And then the same thing would apply. You could study the dynamics um, near uh, the fixed point by taking, looking at the Jacobian of F bar evaluated at any of these points. Okay, and then the dynamics near this period K point uh, gets reduced to an associated linear map. All right. There isn't any analogous technique for, so let's say that K is uh, infinite so that you have a quasi-periodic torus. There's no analogous technique for reduction, right? Um, there might be, and I just don't know it. Okay. But yeah, when you've got period K points, it's particularly simple, so. Um, Maybe I can even go back to my my picture here. Um, I can see in this kind of Swiss cheese diagram that, oh, there's gonna be a lot of period K points. Here's a period one point that we found, actually an unstable one. And then you uh, uh, that's the black point in the middle and it's got unstable and stable manifolds that we've traced out for a long ways and you see them intersecting. Um, so this was a point where when we did the analysis near the point, uh, we get a two by two matrix, which has uh, a stable part and an unstable part. And then these are the corresponding, the local straight lines are the corresponding eigen uh, vectors. And so those are the subspaces. When we start with initial conditions on that and then follow them forward under the map, we're actually able to globalize these stable and unstable manifolds. Uh, the target pattern thing, like this point in here, this point is a period two point. So if you start there, I think it bounces between that point and over here. So you get each of these is a period two point. 
And if you do the analysis near one of those points, it's a two-dimensional center manifold, and that's why you have these closed curves. Um, yep. So that is uh, a nice visual, maybe, to have in mind. All right. So we've already defined before what the uh, how you get the the stable and unstable um, and center subspaces. It's related to this. You take this Jacobian near the fixed point um, n by n matrix, and then you look at its eigenvalues. And the major dividing line between stability and instability is no longer right half plane and left half plane. We're talking about uh, whether you're inside or outside the unit circle or the modulus is the, the modulus of the um, eigenvalues. So if you have uh, right, E S, this is the span of eigenvectors corresponding to eigenvalues of modulus less than one. So everything that's inside the unit circle, E U, the span of eigenvectors corresponding to eigenvalues of modulus greater than one, which means they're outside the unit circle. Something like that. And then EC span the, and by eigenvectors, I mean generalized eigenvectors so that you can handle complex uh, eigenvalues. The span of the generalized eigenvectors corresponding to eigenvalues of modulus equal to one. So these would be on the unit circle. All right. So the dynamics near any fixed point um, uh, it's we have a decomposition into there's the stable, unstable, and center subspaces. If you're on the center subspace, things will just shrink towards the equilibrium point or the fixed point. If you're on the unstable subspace, it moves away. And uh, on the center manifold, we just don't know. We have to look at the nonlinear terms to figure out the stability of a point. So very analogous to what we've already done for the uh, for ODEs. So the in that Wiggins section, we have the same theorems hold for maps. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the details of the theorems. I guess one of the main things is we, so you you do a transformation um, so that the origin is the fixed point of interest. Um, and then the center manifold of the origin. And we'll just look at the case where, um, well, I guess I have to do some setup. Hold on, let me do some setup. Um, we'll first look at the case where we just have stable and center. Because if we have an unstable um, subspace, then we already know that the equilibrium point is unstable. And let's, we want to motivate the discussion of center manifold theory by we need to look at the center manifold to find out the stability of an equilibrium point. Um, 
maybe I'll get rid of this. We're not, we're not yet there. Um, so here's our setting. Basically just ES and EC, the stable and center subspace. And we will, like before, put our system in a form. So we may have to do a linear transformation to do this, but the X variables will be the stable. No, actually the X variables are the center variables. The Y variables are the stable variables. So X maps to AX plus F of X, Y. Y maps to BY plus G x y where x and y these are the center variables and the stable variables uh, a is a c by c matrix having uh, eigenvalues with modulus equal to one. B is a S by S matrix having eigenvalues modulus greater than one, sorry, less than one. Okay. The other way to look at this would be so X N plus one equals A applied to x n plus f of x n x n y n remember that so f is the purely nonlinear terms y n plus one is b is y n plus g uh, x n y n so that f and g are purely nonlinear Oh, second order and higher. There's a question? Check over there. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So we're interested in the stability of the origin, just like before. So now the same theorems uh, hold uh, for maps as they did for the ODEs. So we have, there's existence of reduced dynamics on the center manifold. So uh, just as a picture, right, we've got our, our X variables, which are E, uh, E, C, and then our Y variables, which are along the stable direction. There's a, there's a stable manifold of the origin. And there's also going to be an unstable manifold of the origin. Sorry, center manifold of the origin. And we're going to represent this as y equals h of x. Right, it's going to be some curve um, that is tangent to the center subspace at the origin. Um, it doesn't have any constant or linear term. The first uh, terms will be quadratic when we do our Taylor series expansion. So we have, there's a center manifold. Um, given by Y equals H of X. Um, and we're only looking at 
things very close to the origin. So magnitude of X is less than delta, and delta is small. The map restricted to the center manifold of the origin is U maps to A U plus F U H U. Uh, and we'll call this, this is our reduced equation, right? And so by looking at this reduced equation, which is going to be nonlinear, well, it'll, it, it may have a linear part, hold on. Uh, but the nonlinear terms will be telling us uh, whether or not the origin is stable. And so to get that, um, we need to find out what is h of x. So we'll use the a Taylor, Taylor um, series approximation. A question regarding the figure. Yeah. So. For a given initial condition along, say, the stable manifold, it won't actually look like a smooth curve, though. It'll look like a sequence of discrete points, right? That's right, but they will lie on a smooth curve. Right, okay, that makes sense. So, yeah, it's a good point. Like, you know, you've got a point here, it'll kind of just discreetly map to another point. But, um, but there is still, it's still on some smooth curve, smooth enough. Uh, all right. So first, uh, to get the reduced equation, we need an equation for the center manifold. And it has the form of uh, y equals h of x. So it's a graph, if you want, this is a graph. Remember it's local, we're only looking at locally. It's a graph over the center variables. Uh, if you want to see that, so the functional form h is taking in points from EC and kind of mapping them into ES, right, X. This is, this, this is just what the graph looks like. This isn't the iterated map. Um, so we have something of this form. In particular, what do we mean? We mean that Y n plus one equals H of X n plus one. <coughs> And now we'll just rewrite this, x plus one minus y n plus one equals zero. And now we'll plug in the actual maps. We've got these, if you want, this, the way that we've written it over, over here of x n plus one and y n, n plus one. Just plug it into this. Um, if you remember, so from when we did this for the uh, ODEs, this was what we called the, the tangency condition, but now it's just describing the invariance of uh, the center manifold because it's the invariant center manifold. So plugging in all the terms, what do we get? H, A, X, N plus F, X, N, on the H X N minus B H X N minus G X N H X N equals zero. And we can drop the subscript N since this holds for all of the X on the center manifold.
So we have this, we've just dropped the subscript. I don't want you to be worrying about, you know, does this have to be discrete or anything? Uh, minus B H X minus G X H X equals zero. Is that it? All right. So this is the equation that H must satisfy in order to be invariant under the map F. Um, so it does involve map composition in several different places. We've got f is a function of x and h of x, and then all of that is a function of h. So I think it's actually more complicated to get the center manifold for maps than it is for the vector fields. Um, so just as a you know as a comparison um, for vector fields. we had you know y equals h of x and then we just took the time derivative and we got dh x x dot minus y dot equals zero was our uh, equation that h had to satisfy plugging in x dot and y dot in terms of a and b and f and g okay so then this is the main thing you get once you get once you've got H uh, and you'll use a Taylor series approximation, then the, to find out the dynamics along the center manifold, you look at this reduced equation. It's the dynamics reduced to the center manifold, uh, which definitely makes sense if all, you, uh, if all the other directions are stable because everything, right, all other initial conditions are going to kind of quickly go to your center manifold and then the long-term fate is determined by what happens along the center manifold. Do you go towards the origin? Do you go away from the origin? And remember, since this is a map, there could be cases where you're sort of jumping back and forth across the origin. That's something we don't get with uh, vector fields, but you can get with maps. So I'm going to do uh, a 2D example that time. And if we're lucky, maybe I'll do another example. So let's just jump into the example. Um, uh, unless, are there questions about the kind of the setup so far? Not, we'll just dive in. Okay, so this is a 2D example. And uh, if you if you want to read about it, uh, it's example eighteen point four point two of Wiggins. So what do we got here? Here we've got x, y. This is how it's written. Maps to zero and so what this the, the linear part is already written out explicitly as a two by two matrix so we've got that for the linear part but then there is a non-linear part uh so x y this is in uh this is, these are it's a point in r2 all right uh, we look at this, we see that the origin is a fixed point. Because you plug in X and Y equals zero and you get zero. Um, look at this uh, two by two matrix. We could compute the eigenvalues for it. And the eigenvalues are one and one half.
So this is not yet in the form that we that we need. Um, right, we need we need to separate our two. We need this in separated variables. So the x and y here are not in the proper format. So we will need to go to um, put it in block diagonal form. So we've got eigenvalues one and a, a half uh, with corresponding eigenvectors for one. So that would be the center direction. This is one, one. And for one half, that is, it has modulus less than one. So it's a stable direction. We get uh, eigenvector um, two, one. So if you want, make a little sketch. X and Y, we've got uh, this E1. E1 is this 45 degree. This is the right. The span of this eigen vector is the uh, center subspace, and then two one is a little over here. This is the stable subspace. So we want to go into variables and I'll call them uh, U and V for these different directions. So we just, we're just going to put this matrix in, um, maybe I'll call this matrix D for lack of anything else. So to put the linearization, the D matrix, in the proper block diagonal form that we need. We're going to use the Eigen basis. So um, we're doing a change of variables that we can write this way from X and Y to U and V where T is so what do we need first we need the center direction first so we put that column vector first and then the stable uh, next so just because it's going to come up i just want you to note what does this give you for y y equals u plus v um, i guess if you care x equals u plus 2v but the Y one's going to become important because it shows up in our nonlinear term here. Um, also, we could, it's a, since it's a two by two matrix, we could pretty easily get the inverse. I'll just give it to you. Negative one, two, one, negative one. All right. Um, then what? So we've got Let's just rewrite the map in terms of u and v. So for the left-hand side, t u v maps to, we've got our d matrix times t u v plus, and now we need to write this, the nonlinear part in terms of u and v. And that's why I wrote out here, okay, what is y in terms of u and v? All right, so we got zero and then uh, minus y cubed. So that means minus u plus v cubed. Okay. Now multiply uh, both sides by t inverse. And uv maps to t inverse d t v plus t inverse of this thing, okay. We know what T inverse DT is, because since we put this in block diagonal form, we'll have, um, this will be uh, a diagonal matrix at capital lambda with the center eigenvalue along the diagonal and then the stable eigenvalue. So that's what we got. We could work out what this T inverse U and V is because we have T inverse and everything. So what do we have? Here's what we end up with. UV maps to one, zero, 
uh, zero one half u v plus minus two u plus v cubed and then u plus v cubed. Okay, and now now this is in the proper form. We have separated the stable and the unstable variables. Uh, we've got A equals one, B equals one half, F is negative two u plus v cubed, g is u plus v cubed. Okay, great. So in the new variables, we've got um, in the u, this is uh, the ec, and then in the v, es, what we want is the center manifold, the origin, which we're gonna write as V equals H of U, okay? So we seek the center manifold and now, now we do, um, we put in the first few terms for a Taylor series expansion. There's no constant, there's no linear term. So the first term, um, say there's some unknown A times U squared plus B, U cubed. Professor? And yeah. Um, so because these eigenvectors are, don't happen to be orthogonal to each other, is this just a schematic that you've drawn or? Um, um, do you see I'm what not I'm sure asking? what you're. Uh, I guess you're asking if I was to write what u and v is up up here, like what would it look like? Well, because I mean, it, in in I the u and v space, this is what it looks like. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we can visual we can conceptualize it to be looking like this, even though u and v are not actually orthogonal. Yeah. Yeah. So if you had some kind of point here, this orange point, I'm not sure how it'll map up here. Like it might go like over right. here somewhere. Sure. But, sure. Yeah. Okay. You're just mapping it out like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but through the mapping, you could figure it out. Yeah. Cause it doesn't even look like, uh, like unfortunately ES is below EC. So, you know, what's going on? There may be some weird twisting going on. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, that's the benefit of looking in the the eigen basis is now everything's we've um, we've transformed linearly the best we can to make it as easy to handle as possible. Um, normal form theory is then doing nonlinear transformations to make nonlinear terms look as best you can. But that's a preview. We won't do that yet. Um, okay, so for this. You know, maybe we'll have to go to fourth order. I don't know, but since I know the answer, we don't. All right, so now we're looking for a center manifold that looks like that. And now we have to plug in to that uh, horrendous equation that had multiple map compositions um, to get the, the center manifold. So now we, whoops, we substitute into the center manifold equation. All right, that was uh, related to the center manifolds invariance. Uh, I'll just write out what it was, H, A, um, and we're using U instead of X. So H, A, U plus F, U, H, U minus B, H, U minus G, U, H, U equals zero. Okay, and so fortunately, we've already identified what A, B, F, and G are. So we'll just plug in uh, what we've got here for our Taylor series expansion. And it's not, you know, pretty. It's not gonna be pretty, right? This is all H, so H, we've got 
a, now I use the square brackets, u minus, what was f? Is minus two u plus, and now I have to write h again because uh, that's what comes next. This is u plus v. So let's see a u squared plus, and it is not pleasant. That thing raised to the third power, and the square brackets, that whole thing <laughs> squared. So you can see this is not going to be terribly pretty. Plus b, which do the same thing, but the square bracket is cubed. u minus 2 u plus a u squared. So this is where you could start estimating what are the orders going to be and do I really have to do all of this? Um, and then what do we have? We have you know some kind of order four term for h. Now that was for this part. Now we have to do minus b minus g. All right. Um, minus, and what was b? One half uh, h. Okay, put in h. A u squared plus b u cubed plus order four. Um, all right. That was this part minus b h u. Now we do minus g. And what is that? Minus. Uh, okay. U plus V, but instead of V, we put H U. A U squared plus B U cubed plus order four. That whole thing raised to the third power equals zero. Okay. Ooh. All right. Um, so now. Multiply everything out and collect terms. Uh, so this is what we get here. So for this first term, I, I already know this is going to be a, and then this thing squared will give me leading order is u squared, and then everything else. What am I going to get? I think the next term is order four. So unless I really have to calculate it, I'm not. I'm not going to. And then same for the next one with b. I'll have u raised to the third power. So you got. You kind of have to know your Taylor series expansions of what. Uh, or I guess it's the binomial expansion and so on. But you get used to it. Or you could just work it out by hand and figure it out. So that's what we get from that. Um, all right, then what? Minus one half a u squared minus one half b u cubed. That's what we get from here. And then terms we ignore. Um, and then minus, what do I get from this? I'll get uh, u cubed plus next order term is four. Okay, so it looks like I've got everything through order. Uh, I've got second order terms and third order terms. Now I just group the terms. So for the, that's the second order terms. Then there'll be b minus one half b minus one cubic terms plus stuff of order four. All right. Um, the coefficient of each term has to be zero. So for this to equal zero, this tells us a equals zero. So it's a good thing we kept that cubic term up here, isn't it? Because for this to equal zero, this implies uh, b equals two. Okay, wow, we did all of this to find out h u equals two u cubed. I guess we found out there's no, it's not quadratic, it's actually looks like that. So in our little sketch of what the, 
the the shape of the center manifold it is a cubic the positive coefficient so there we go that's our local center manifold of the origin we don't know uh, what the arrows are doing and we also we don't know or really care what the stable manifold looks like um, well, I'll put double arrows going towards the origin just to emphasize that things are collapsing to the center manifold. All right, now we can look at the, the map restricted to the center manifold. Uh, I think the first calculation of just calculating the center manifold um, is harder. And you'll have to do you know approximations to make your life a little bit easier. Um, all right, so now the map restricted to the center manifold is uh, u maps to a u plus f u h u. Okay, so what is this? Um, we have u minus two u plus two u cubed plus something of order four raised to the third power. All right, um, I guess we have this little maps thing is, so u maps to u minus two u cubed. Uh, the next order term is actually a fifth order term. So, so there we go, that's our map. Um, So now I want you to, you need to think of the magnitude of u being much less than one. And then what's going on? So I'll just do a schematic here, sort of, this is along the center manifold. Remember u is like a curvilinear coordinate along the center manifold. Here is u equals zero. If we have an initial point, u naught, then uh, u naught, maps to u naught minus two u naught cubed. So this will take away a little bit of distance. So u, if we want, this whole thing is u1. Uh, so u1 is a little bit closer to the origin and then it'll keep getting closer and closer and closer. All right, hopefully you see that. Um, that's for positive u. What if I have something over here? Well, then uh, we have u naught maps to u naught. And then this is minus two u one, u naught cubed. So this then still moves us a little bit closer to the origin. So starting on either side of the origin, we seem to be going towards the, the origin. So we see that um, UN is going to zero as N goes to infinity. So u equals zero is stable. And uh, in the full nonlinear system, that point is stable. I mean, I don't know if it was obvious just looking at this map. Oh, the origin is stable. But now we've, you know, we've demonstrated that it is. Okay. Um, sorry. Got about 20 minutes. And 
I wanted to mention something else about center manifold theory. Um, there's a, there's, you might want to look at, because I don't think I'll go through it, but there is a, there's a 3D example. Um, so you can see the 3D example in the book. That's uh, Wiggins example 18.4.1. If you want to see something that's 3D, slightly more complicated. Uh, but what I wanted to say is just as, um, as for vector fields, you can, you can include the, the linearly unstable directions into the calculation. So for, things like symplectic maps that come from Hamiltonian systems, it's kind of unavoidable that you will have unstable directions. Um, and just as for vector fields, you can include parameters and in a pretty straightforward way. So you can include parameter dependence, you know, and find bifurcations. Um, and so I'll do an example that has, has both of these just to illustrate the method. So here's an, here's a, whoa, I don't know what that is. I didn't make that mark. Here's a, another 2D example. And I'll write it this way, x maps to 2x plus 3y, y maps to x plus epsilon, that's an epsilon, so that'll be my parameter that can vary, plus x squared plus xy squared. So oh, this is your points in 2D. Again, you could see the origin um, is already the, a fixed point. Um, so we can put this into form that we that we like because <laughs> it, it's not it's not yet in the proper form, right? If we look at x, y maps to, and now just get out the linear part. Um, I guess, what, what else can I say about this? There's a, there's an implied, the parameter maps to the parameter. Remember how we threw in, in vector fields, we had the epsilon dot equals zero. So when you include parameter dependence, that means the center manifold is a function of uh, the center directions and the parameter directions. Here we just have a one dimensional parameter. Um, but when you group things in terms of, is it linear or nonlinear, anything with a parameter becomes nonlinear. Non so these terms are now nonlinear. Even though this looks linear, epsilon times y, because we've included uh, epsilon into the center directions. So when we write this out, x, y maps to um, the linear part is just two, three, uh, one, zero, because we put uh, anything with the parameter becomes nonlinear. Now, um, if you take the, you get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So what, uh, what does this have? Eigenvalues, it's got negative one and then 
three. So we have an unstable direction because three has a modulus greater than one. Uh, negative one has modulus one. So it's, it's negative one, um, which means on the center manifold, kind of the main thing you'll see is jumping back and forth on the center manifold. Um, and then the corresponding eigenvectors, we've got negative one, one, three, one. Um, <clears throat> and so now we'll put this into, and we'll make a, a transformation of x, y, equals t u v where t equals negative one one three one and go from there and i'll give you what the result is if you do that um we already know this will be we've got the center direction and then the unstable direction. And then the, uh, the nonlinear terms in the eigenbasis are pretty horrendous. Uh, but hey, here they are. Not pretty. Ooh, so terrible. All right, epsilon. Kind of like writing code, I try to put corresponding things beneath uh, the thing up above just to help me keep track. And then what do we have here? All right, not pretty. Okay, so we seek a center manifold. Uh, which is, you know, the center manifold of the origin. Which is now we're writing it in terms of UV and epsilon. Uh, v is written as a function of u and epsilon. And, you know, we could remind ourselves that this is just, we're looking at u is very close to the origin. All right, so we will, uh, let's, we'll assume that v equals h u epsilon uh, has a Taylor series form. So let's say u1 or a1 u squared plus a2 u epsilon plus a3 epsilon squared. That's all the second order terms in u and epsilon. And then maybe there's third order stuff. Who knows? All right, I won't bore you with the computation, but this is what you will get. You end up finding out that what a1 and a2 and whatever are, this becomes negative one eighth u squared plus one sixteenth u epsilon. And then the epsilon squared term is just zero. So then that's what we get. So well, what is this? I guess to a kind of leading order, this is It's like a parabola going down. Now, we're not actually finding out what's the stability of the origin because, because of the linearly unstable directions. We already know the origin is unstable, but maybe we're, we'll find out something more about the structure along the center manifold and how it changes with the parameter. So that's the approximation to the center manifold and um, the map restricted to the center manifold is this. Oh, 
I'll just sort of give the result. Um, the leading part is u maps to negative u. And then we have some other things from the nonlinearity. So that's what we that's what we have. Um, now we could look at different cases. So for epsilon greater than zero, we have that if we start near the origin, and uh, remember we're thinking of magnitude of u is much less than one, right? We're close to the origin. U is sufficiently small. Um, here's u naught. Well, u naught's going to map to the other side because of this leading order thing. You map to the other side, and then this part moves you a little bit further away, and this doesn't save you at all. So we'll actually move um, further away each time. So u equals zero is unstable. Okay. But so something interesting happens when you look at epsilon um, less than uh, epsilon less than zero, because then things don't necessarily leave the origin in the center manifold. Maybe I'll just say things are more interesting um, and why is that? It's not that maybe u equals zero is unstable still, but it's that there's now the possibility of a period two orbit. And what would a period two orbit satisfy? A period two orbit sa would satisfy, if we're calling this map, let's call this um, F, U. Um, U equals two applications of F. So a period two orbit, let's say U bar. If we now plug this in, and look for possibilities. So this would mean u bar maps to um, something big. I won't even bore you with what it is, but um, you could determine that there's a There's a period two orbit at about u plus or minus um, two over square root of three, square root of the magnitude of epsilon, right? Because we've got epsilon is less than zero now. So near our If I were to sketch now what we've got, we've got kind of our, this, here's our center manifold. Oops, we've got points. And they map one to each other. So u plus equals f of u minus, u minus equals f of u, oops, u plus. So period two point. So when, um, just like with the vector field uh, calculations, along center manifolds is where bifurcations can occur. Well, we have a, a bifurcation occurring um, for the map. And I think we could summarize it with a bifurcation diagram. <coughs> um, 
we find out? Did we find out? Wait, hold on. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, I did something wrong here. Um, for epsilon is zero, the origin is actually stable. And so what I sketched is incorrect. You actually get closer and closer. And you should have caught that. I don't know. For epsilon equals zero or epsilon greater than zero? Greater than zero. So this is getting closer and closer to the origin. So the u zero is stable in the in the center subspace, but still unstable uh, so it's you know we've got uh, it's zeroing in on the origin but because we have that linearly unstable direction, this point is still unstable in the full nonlinear system. But then things get more interesting and I think this is the case that these two points become, the origin becomes unstable and these two points become stable. So we can summarize with a bifurcation diagram. And you know, you could double check me as an exercise. Um, but I think, I think this is, this is a bifurcation diagram restricted to the center manifold. So along one direction, we have our parameters, right? And then along this other direction, it's kind of location of equilibria or no period K points. So we've got for epsilon greater than zero, We'll just sort of sketch arrows just to indicate the direction of uh, stability. For epsilon less than zero, the origin becomes unstable. And then we've got these two other points that show up, you know, they're along a parabola. So it's like a map version of the pitchfork bifurcation. In fact, it might be called the map pitchfork bifurcation, but bifurcation. Um, yeah, so there's connections between bifurcation theory and center manifolds, even in the map case. And that's just what this was meant to show. All right, so that's, that's enough for today, in fact, for this week. Uh, any questions? I think once you've got the vector field theory, the map theory um, makes sense, even if it, uh, there's some parts of it that are harder to compute. Plus you have this exotic behavior where things can kind of jump back and forth. And that's just in you know, a 1D center manifold. You could have a 2D, a 3D, 50D, center manifold and then I don't know what's going on then. You can have all kinds of stuff happening. Uh,